everyone, it's Jen. Are you self-employed like me? I know a lot of you are, so I wanted to tell you about Adesso 360. It's the first tool that helps self-employed individuals who have been impacted by COVID receive their FFCRA tax credits. That's right. If you are self-employed, you're likely eligible for tax credits thanks to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So how do you get this money? You go to ffcrarelief.com and use Adesso Capital's portal. It's the first tech platform to automatically calculate tax credits and amend tax returns without requiring financial data, such as your actual tax returns. I don't know about you, but I don't want to have to go try and find an accountant who's familiar with this particular tax credit or spend hours of my own time gathering paperwork and trying to file for tax credits by myself. Why not see if there are tax credits waiting for you? Check your eligibility to see how much you could get back. Visit ffcrarelief.com and use the code FATMASCARA to save 10% off of processing fees. That's ffcrarelief.com and use the code FATMASCARA for 10% off processing fees. If you want to hear, where'd you get that? This holiday season, Uncommon Goods is your secret weapon. Uncommon Goods is here to make your holiday shopping stress-free by scouring the globe to get the most remarkable and unique gifts for everybody on your list. Whether you're shopping for secret Santa or for your entire family, Uncommon Goods knows exactly what you want. I know Jen found something very intriguing. I always find something intriguing. I've been shopping at Uncommon Goods for years. You love Uncommon Goods. I love it. And the gifts I've given people are those things they are like, what? How did you even find this? I swear I've given things to my parents and they said that. One example, I can't remember if this was two years ago or last year, but it is still available on Uncommon Goods if you want to get this. I got my parents this toggle switch plate. <laughs> it's like you put it over a regular on-off light in somebody's house and it has the steampunk little gears to make it into a toggle switch instead. And it looks just like a little special artwork. And if you knew my parents in their house, it's very popular there. And anytime they have a guest in the guest bathroom, they're like, your light switch is so cool. Where'd you get that? Jess, guess where they got it? Uncommon Goods. Well, they got it from me, but I got it from Uncommon Goods. (laughs) You know what I love? When you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. You know, we feel very passionately about that. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash fat mascara. That's uncommongoods.com slash fat mascara for 15% off. Do not miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. As we get into fall and winter, I have a little Gen Science Corner PSA for you. You need to wear your sunscreen every day, no matter the weather or the temperature. And you know our sponsor, Tizo, makes some of our favorite sunscreens. They're 100% mineral sunscreens because it's right there in the name. Tizo stands for titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. Their mineral sunscreens are by far the best choice for your skin, your body, and the environment. We've been raving about Tizo's all mineral sunscreens for so long, but I have to point out, they also have an incredible skincare line that focuses on the reversal of photo damage. There are products like the Advanced Vitamin C and E Serum and a great starter kit called the Photoceutical Skin Revitalizing Regimen. If you want a skincare regimen that's all there for you, nothing to think about or figure out, it's five full-size products with everything you need from cleanser to sunscreen. Just do not sleep on that cleanser in that regimen, mm-hmm. actually. It's foaming, but it's pH bound, so it's like gentle and doesn't dry out your skin, which you know is what we're all about this time of year here at Fat Mascara. If you want to check out Tizo Skincare and their award-winning best-selling mineral sunscreen, that's the Tizo 3 Tinted SPF 40 you always hear us talking about, we've got a discount code for you. Go to tizoskin.com and use the code FATMASCARA15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order. That's T-I-Z-O skin.com and use the code FATMASCARA15 for 15% off your order. Jen has already dubbed this episode an FM classic. Welcome to the show. It is! I'm Jess. I'm Jen. And we are going to be here in the studio in just a few minutes with Mandy Aftel. She is a natural perfumer. She is a curator in her museum in Berkeley. I mean... She's a biographer. She's a flavorist. She's an author. How many books does she have now? I think, I think she's like nine. But she'll, she'll I think this us. might be her 10th. And this, when I say this, is the reason we're having her on now, a timely interview, because 
Earlier this week on Halloween, she put out her latest book, The Museum of Scent, Exploring the Curious and Wondrous World of Fragrance. And wow, is this interview wondrous. But also this book. Jess and I are obsessed with this book. This is like the book where if I were like a little kid and I got this book, like I would take this book around like a Linus blanket. I don't need to be a little kid. I've literally been carrying it from room to room. Now I'm going to look at it in this room. Oh, I liked that picture. I need to go back to that illustration. What is... I didn't even get to talk to her about the Ontax, the shell that has the smell. I just need to go to the museum. Anyway, the book is amazing. Gorgeous gift for a perfume lover in your life, let yeah. me tell you. If you are a scent lover, if you are like, if you are committed to fragrance, if you are committed to that fragrance life, <laughs> you need this book. You don't even have to be like a, like a crazy natural fragrance lover. Man, you might slap me for saying this, but it will help you understand the fragrances that you already have so much better. And a lot of words that you probably hear us throw around when we're talking about fragrances, Jess and I have been writing about this for years, but they give you the history of them. It wasn't just like, here is what this smells like. Also, there's yeah. a scented bookmark. Oh, what? the scented bookmark. Nice touch. It's at the back. Yeah. So it's a very nice giftable book. Okay, this is not a commercial for Mandy's book because honestly, Mandy has just been a resource to me throughout my career as a journalist mm -hmm. and I know to Jessica as well. One of those people that just like you could dive into her mind and like hang out for a while. So we're going to do that. You ready to do that? Let's go. Okay, we are here with Mandy and I'm so excited. First of all, I wish I, this, we're in like a little virtual studio, but Manny has this amazing perfume organ behind her. We're in the studio. But I wanted to ask Mandy, I had like this whole long wind up intro for her. Mandy, how would you describe yourself? I would say I'm four things. I'm a natural artisan perfumer, which means I make everything myself by hand. I'm a curator because I made a museum. Yep, you're in it right now. And I'm an author because I've written six books on this, nine books altogether. And I'm a teacher. I teach on Zoom all over the world to people to make perfume. And a lot of people who you probably, perfumes you have, have studied with me. Very cool. How did you first fall in love with fragrance? You know, I got into fragrance in kind of how I've gotten into everything in my life. I just follow what I'm interested in. So I used to be a therapist for artists and writers. And I had a very large private practice. I was very interested in it. And I had written a book and decided I wanted to write a novel and make my main character a perfumer. And I'm not really sure why I thought that was a good idea, but I did. And I started with books, a uh, hundred year old books. And I would go to book fairs and look for them because I was really only interested in natural materials because I knew they were connected to people and culture all over the globe. They were this amazing material. So I started to read these hundred-year-old books and I just loved them. They were full of lore and magic and rituals and sexuality. They were just completely interesting to me. And then I thought, well, for my research, I should go take a class. So I went to a aromatherapy studio that could teach you to make a little basic perfume. And the minute I smelled the essences, I just loved them. I just thought they were the most incredible, mysterious, great ingredients in the whole world. And I had a friend at that time and she said, let's start a perfume line. We're going back now almost 30 years. And so we started a perfume line that started in Neiman Marcus. And I made all the perfumes. We debuted there. What was it called? It was called Grand Florum Perfumes. And they were the first natural perfumes and it came to a bad end and I was back out of it soon and it went away. And then I was hooked, obsessed, a maniac about it all. <laughs> and so I wrote a book. My best friend had published my psychology book I had written before that. And I came upon this idea that perfume could follow the steps of transformation and alchemy. So I wrote a book called Essence and Alchemy 20 some years ago, and it just was published in its 14th language edition in France by the incredible publishers, Ness or Ney, yeah. that you guys know. They publish it in France and very behind an artisan natural perfumer uh, writing a book. And it's now coming out in Vietnam and then it'll be coming out in Korea. It continues to go on, that book. I've revised it last year. And so I just kind of love that whole world. And for me, when I found that world, it was kind of in my head. 
You know, it was put together by the oils and all the things I read, kind of like a perfume. But when I made the museum, I kind of made Essence and Alchemy come to life. And it is kind of the gateway drug to most people who work in an artisanal way, natural or synthetic, they start with that book. So it's, it spoke to them. And I was very lucky. So it's really clear that some people see fragrance and it's it's just, you know, something they they enjoy it just sort of at face value or it's just a fragrance. For you, it's very clear it's about something more. How has fragrance really opened up your world? What does it say to you? Why does it speak to the how does it speak to the wider world? It is the wider world, actually. It really, really is. There is no culture in any period of time that didn't use natural scented materials for the most important things in their life. Eating, praying, making love, being buried, drinking. It threads through everything it is to be human. And it's connected to that in a personal way. It's both kind of on the ground and simple and very complicated. So the perfume industry is really the commercial perfume industry is the far end of that chain. But people have instinctually loved rubbing scented things on their body and eating them and taking them with them to the next world. And once you understand that, even if you don't know it too well, it resonates with your core at a deeper level and it just does its magic. Natural, synthetic, doesn't matter what it is. I think it reverberates with who we are. And it did that for me. The way you talk about it, it's very tactile. Like get your hands in there and get kind of dirty with it. And I'm curious, is that why you opened the Aftel Archive of Curious Sense? When did the museum come about and why? The museum came about, I thought the museum coming about was the most lunatic idea I ever had. You know, I really <laughs> did think it was nuts. It took us three years. I was traveling around to these little tiny museums in the gold country in California, where there's almost nothing in the town, a little museum filled with stuff from the gold rush, which I kind of love. And I looked at it one day and I had been collecting stuff for so long that I thought was so beautiful. So when people would come to my studio and visit, I would get it all out and I would show it to them. And I was never sure if they were being polite because they seemed to love it. But I just thought, you know, I have all this stuff and no one will ever see it if I don't do something. And it's kind of the history of humanity. So I wanted people to share in what I had. So it took me three years to make the museum. And I think the most common thing said while we were in there is, oh, my God, we have no idea what we're doing. I mean, I hope this turns out. I hope someone comes one day. The materials, I feel like, they just carried it on. It's extraordinarily beautiful in there. I got all these shelves made. I learned from watching my museum goers, which we've had thousands and thousands of them. That I just wanted people to really interact with the materials without being marketed to. I wanted to see what would happen. It was interesting to me. And it turned out it was interesting to them because over half of our visitors are repeat visitors. Almost half of them come back with another person because they want to show it to them. It's just like a big family all over the world. I'm curious, who were you showing these things to before the museum existed? Like private clients or just friends or the mailman? The, the, <laughs> I, people would come and wanted to see me after I wrote that book or I did some big jobs, stuff in my studio. I used to have a studio sale at Christmas time, and I had artifacts. I still do, if you saw. I didn't deplete everything I had. I have a lot of stuff. And it, for me, I have these hand-tinted postcards of people gathering materials at Harvest, which is in the book. Yeah, the, the book has so many postcards and illustrations that really bring to life what you just said at the top, which is fragrance, really being a part of people's lives, their death, their... Rituals. The, yeah, the rituals. Yeah, I remember the sex part, but yes, all that. Yeah. <laughs> the also, for me, for me, because I work in flavor, and I did do two cookbooks with Daniel Patterson, a three-star Michelin chef, I'm, and I have chef's essences. I have a line of flavors. For me, perfume is very connected to food. 
And creating flavor and creating perfume for me are very allied in, in my mind. So a lot of the materials people are very familiar with from food and from gardening. So I would show people that because everybody does a little bit of gardening or cooks. And so it's just a way in past kind of the formed commercial brands, just into the materials, which can go in a million ways. What would you show us first if Jess and I showed up on your doorstep of the museum? I have so many things here, which I would show you. I have a pomander. Did you see that? Yeah, in the book? In the book. So I got a pomander, and that was during the plague. Can you explain what a pomander is? The only reason why I know what one is is because Lark Dazan made a pomander. A pomander was something that they used during the plague, and I happened to have gotten it during COVID. I always wanted one, but this one had a very special significance for me, so I really wanted it. What it is, is it's a receptacle, and if you were wealthy, which this person was, whoever they were, if you were wealthy, you could get them made out of silver and gold and jewels, and it has a receptacle in it for putting scented material, so you could smell it when you went through the streets. Sometimes it was in a cane. The really fancy ones were just ambergris in the top of a cane. And so this one happened to have a jeweled opium poppy, a gold one, with a ruby and a a turquoise in it. But the clincher for me was there was a monkey playing the violin. (laughs) And in the Leonard Cohen song, First We Take Manhattan, he talks about the monkey playing the violin. And I did make perfume for Leonard Cohen for 20 years. And I felt that Leonard was saying, get that pomander. (laughs) you got to put that in the museum. So I bought it. So that would be number one. When is that from what time period? I think it's from 1790. Wow. I think it's from 1790 and it's extremely beautiful. Where do you find something from 1790? Because you're not like buying that on eBay. Like where do you find this (laughs) stuff? If people have stuff, that's always happened. I have a hundred year old oils. When people have things, they'll often come to me and sell them to me or find me. Yes, I'm known in that world. But there also, sadly, is not much for me to find anymore. And I like the hunt. Everything in there is original and meaningful, and there's nothing that's a reproduction. So I've got as much as I can get my hands on. My latest acquisition, which I would show you, I have two of them. I have old herbals, Herbals, I have the one from 1640, which we just traded up. It's something called the Theatrum Botanicum. And it was one of the very first herbals that actually knew what they were talking about. But the the ones that don't know what they're talking about are terrific too. But this one's very educated. And after every entry, they have something called the virtues. And there they tell you what to do with the herbs. But all of the drawings in the herbal I put on watercolor paper and I painted them So because they very lovingly rendered those plants. They looked at them, they penetrated them. So those drawings that are in the book are from the illustrations from the Theatrum Botanicum, which is in the museum. And that's like, an herbal is like a dictionary of botanicals. How would you describe it for people who haven't read the book yet? Yes, they are. I have another one that's by a charlatan, which I also love. He's in disrepute. He's in none of the herbal histories at all. And some of it is very accurate and some of it is really wild, but it's a way to understand the plants for healing. Wait, so experts like yourself are not sure about how he compiled it? You don't like his... Oh, his stuff on frankincense, it's clear he's never seen a plant in his life. It's so wrong. And I saw (laughs) he got expunged from the records, but he's a snack oil salesman. From what time period? He's from the 1700s. Okay. And he has beautiful illustrations different from the others. Everything in there, you feel it when you're in there. It's a story. It's a connection to everything. So even if it's wrong, it's part of the history of It's part of the lore. It's part of the witchcraft. It's part of why people wear eyeshadow. It's just a part of adornment. It's just special stuff of which we're still, they do have histories of makeup, And makeup recipes, which would curl your hair, right with the perfume recipes, lead dye, you know, all kinds of stuff. But it's very interesting because it's culture and sexuality. (laughs) And sexuality, Jen. 
Um, Thank that's you. in there too. <laughs> so, <laughs> what one more so, I would show wait. you, which is the oud. I have real oud. Oh, mm-hmm. I have really, really speaking of sexy, real, real oud. I have the real thing, and a lot of what's said to be oud isn't. So I have a very, I have two very large pieces, and then I have a a display of small pieces. I had a student who was a very, very fine incense maker, and he died, and he left me his oud collection. So it has oud from all over the globe, and really good oud, and I have oud you could smell that's $50,000 a kilo. You get to smell everything out in my rose garden. The smelling takes place outside, 50 things. And the looking and touching takes place indoors. Everybody who experiences the museum gets to do this. Everybody. Mandy, you said something really interesting, just that this is all lore. This is all a mystery. This is all just really exciting information. And that you wrote the book, the new book, The Museum of Sen. It's not that you want things to be in and understood, but that you wrote you want it to reverberate. And I'm going to quote you here. I thought this was a really beautiful line. It's an invitation to an awareness of ways that we have forgotten. And you said... While modern society tries to transform us into ghosts or robots, we can instead feel alive and engaged with nature. I thought that was so beautiful because it feels like something that is just not done today. You're not trying to make anyone understand. There is no real end result or objective to this book. You're just inviting people into a world to experience something that is lost, but connects people and invites them really to kind of dream and think about how we're all connected by this mysterious stuff, if I can call it stuff, for this purpose (laughs) of this conversation. I love, I'm so moved. I'm going to cry. Nobody is doing this. Nobody is doing this. I do know. And I appreciate it so deeply. You know, I see every museum visitor. I introduce myself. I thank them for coming. And in the worst of COVID, they are so happy out there, so appreciative. I don't know who they are in the rest of their life, but they're the nicest people I've ever seen. That has a magic on them. And I, I see it take place. I see them absolutely transformed. They thank me when they leave and they tell me all the little things they noticed. It's as though there's a kind of magic to engaging with things that are beautiful. Beauty, I think, is very healing. I think it goes through who we are in terms of culture or sexuality or race. or It's something we all share. And I feel like it just wakes up and a lot of them will say like, you know, how can I keep this going or what can I do in my life? They'll recognize they've been transformed while they're there in that milieu. And I have some tiny answers for people, but I personally feel that way. I'm no different yeah. than the visitors. I feel like when I go in there, I feel like something takes place for me, which is I wanted to put this thing in the world that didn't exist. And when I was reading the book, I felt like how I, I got lost in it in a way that it was like, all right, I got to look at this book. I'm interviewing Mandy, you know, in a couple of months. Okay. And then I got to, like, it was like, I got lost in a book the way when I would get a book as a gift when I was younger and there was no kind of beginning, middle, end. It was just like cool things to look at and like, oh, I have a favorite page. That sort of feeling. I don't know how you felt, Jen. Just kind of. Do you have a favorite page? Me? No, Jess. I'm, now I'm curious. <laughs> I like the, the, with the, the women with all the violets. Oh, and the captions. Did you see all those captions swimming in violets? Yeah. Knee yeah. deep in whatever. I love those pictures because people will always ask me, oh, because I have a rose garden that they're in. I have a hundred rose plants. It's pretty gorgeous. It's the end pages of the book are my garden but they'll say, oh, do you, so do you just all the roses? And I always point them to these people that are in like <laughs> tons of it and say, you know, no, I really, I really don't have enough. You don't have enough. <laughs> I feel like it's a piece of what people want when they buy perfume. They want that transformative experience. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I'm very lucky to be in that world every day 
making things and being around that stuff. I feel very, very lucky. Yeah. Can I ask you about some of the stories in the book, though, just for people who haven't experienced yet? The one you pointed out, Jess, was very romantic, but I'm curious, Mandy, what's the most romantic, fragrant story that you found in your life and shared in this book? Or maybe it's not in the book, it's in the museum, like a, a story of romance tied to perfume. Well, what's interesting is I have a, I have a couple temporary exhibits outdoors, and I take a slice of my perfume organ. Or did you all ever see I have a perfume wheel? Yeah, yeah, I think I've seen it. This is my perfume wheel that people use that study yes. with me, and there are different families. So I took this area called the narcotic florals, and I put them outside as an exhibit that people could smell, and they are the sexiest. I like the narcotic florals. The narcotic florals. So, it, it, so the narcotic florals are champaca, gardenia, jasmine, orange flower, and tuberose. And each of them is like five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a kilo or more. And so I put them out for everyone to be able to smell. And it was a very sexy exhibit. And I could see people being very transformed when they got to smell the whole lot of them because all the narcotic florals have this molecule in them called indole, which is the poopy, if you don't mind, because there is no No, Jess calls it baby diapers. I'm giggling because she's always called it baby diapers diapers. over the years. (laughs) So there's in all of the narcotic florals, there's indole which is also in poop, which makes that fecal floral, which makes that yin and yang when it's just pretty, just like life, when it's just that and doesn't have the funk, it's not the same. So that's a very sexy exhibit that we've had outside for people to be able to smell. I thought that was a very, very sexy one. Wow. Is there a fragrance ingredient that you think is very misunderstood? I think oud is quite misunderstood because it's so expensive. Almost no one really uses the real thing. So the real thing, which exists in very few trees and has to pass through sustainability regulations to be gotten, because I have it, it does cost $50,000 a kilo. And it has a world of aromas. The tree gets this disease and that makes the resin that makes oud. So I think that's a very misunderstood very copied ingredient that is really, when you smell the real thing, it's kind of like entering a world where you can't believe something has so many facets of smell tucked into its little body. I think other misunderstood, I have some others too. There's many, I have many, because I've thought about this. I think that amber, the idea for amber is very disconnected to reality. Because the only, in the natural world, as opposed to synthetic world, the only real ambery smell is labdanum. Labdanum is the smell of amber. Tell us what labdanum is. Labdanum is the rock rose plant. It grows all over California, and it's in the stems and the underside of the leaves. It's a resin, and you have to boil it off to get to it, but it's very, very ambery. It's a particular smell and it really is ambery. People often think it's amber beads, which it isn't. Yeah. Why does it have the name amber? I've always wondered this. That family of fragrance notes, if they're not fossilized trees out. Because they're, I, I don't know. I think somebody must have put that there. I think the word amber is not a bad description. For the smell, it's warm. It's honeyish. It's in some way a synesthetic thing. I think if that color had a smell it might smell like It'd be that honey yes be honey color yes i think that another thing that's misunderstood is i taught a long time ago a class for johnny ive for the apple design team a perfume class and it was all men and i brought my things to where we were doing the class and they all made perfumes and it was very interesting because this was a little while ago. And people always think men won't like florals, but they could not get enough of the florals, which is something I've seen through my entire career, that the kind of gender stereotyping for smell doesn't really hold up. Men love florals. They just do. When I teach, I teach men as well. They really love florals. So I think some of the shorthand about fragrance is misunderstood. Skincare 
hair can be confusing. Look at us. We made a whole entire podcast about it. Well, about beauty too. But I am going to simplify things for you. All you have to do is look for the label, The Inky List. I'm sure you've heard about it. It's like all the other products out there can get confusing. Is it a serum? Is it a toner? Is it a toner serum? What does it do? The Inky List lays it out for you right there on the label with the ingredients that you want. You can shop for acne care. If you want to reduce fine lines, if you want to boost hydration, The Inky List creates a unique skin care routine that really works. So you can reach your skin goals. Even if you don't know where to start, just go to their website. Your first stop will be their online skincare quiz. Makes it super easy for you to find a product you like. And the Inky List just launched a new product that's going to take your routine to the next level. The Tripeptide Plumping Lip Balm. With the new Tripeptide Plumping Lip Balm, you can get up to 40% plumper lips in just four weeks. I keep it right by my bedside. No filter, no filler, just fuller. Check out the before and afters on their website if you don't believe me. Jen, you saw the difference. I saw it on your face. I don't even need to go to the website. (laughs) You see it right on the computer screen. It's also available at Sephora. That's right. And guess what? The Inky List is offering our listeners 20% off their purchase with promo code FATMASCARA, all in caps. Go to theinkylist.com. That's spelled I-N-K-E-Y. So the inkylist.com and use promo code fat mascara for 20% off your order. That's the inky list, I N K E Y, the inky list.com. And the promo code is fat mascara in all caps for 20% off. Jen, I love when I'm going to a wedding and I know that the people getting married are using Zola. Yes. And you know right away because the save the dates there, it's all easy. I just went to a wedding. The couple used Zola and they even had a registry for like a no fee cash fund. But they said in the little description that they were going to use the money to put together a garden in their new home. So I felt like I was like part of building their home together. And another good thing about Zola, if you're a guest, Mm -hmm. you don't have to bug them with all your questions. How annoying when you were a bride, when everybody was like, texting you two days before. Where am I supposed to be when? What time is this? What should I wear? If you use Zola, it's all there for them. Oh my gosh, the details of like the bus and the hotel and the, uh, I can't. It was, just go to the website. You could say, just go to the website. Thank you, Zola. I love that it also allows you to browse the couple's wedding website and learn about their personal story, maybe how they met, introduction to the wedding party. <laughs> Super cute. I'm sorry, but I love that stuff. Listen, when you're getting married, it's not just about the big day. It's about all the days along the way. And Zola's here for all of them. Start planning at Zola.com. That's Z-O-L-A.com. Again, Zola.com. Make your life easier. Make your guest life easier. It's great. Honey love, honey love, honey love. Just saying honey love makes me feel more relaxed, like I'm in one of these beautiful honey love bras. It's like body ASMR. It is like body ASMR. So it's comfortable. Soft. It's like a second skin. It's next level comfortable. It sure is. You guys know, you've heard us talk about Honey Love and all of their shapewear and the bra that Jess thinks I haven't taken off for the last six months, but I have, and I've hand washed it and it washes beautifully. All of their fabrics are so seamless. They have like mesh detailing. So they look a little bit sexy, even though they're super comfortable. None of that back bulge, no uniboob. You're getting all of that support and that huggy body ASMR feeling Jess was talking mm. about, but still have a nice silhouette and look good. And we have like a big discount for you guys. It's 20% off at honeylove.com slash mascara. Use our exclusive link to get 20% off at, you know, you've got it, honeylove.com slash mascara. After you purchase, they're going to ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you, Jen and Jess. It's time to ditch that underwire for good. Thanks to Honeylove. Do you think that like a lot of the major mass market, when I say mass market, I just mean like the way fragrance is marketed to men, 21st Mm -hmm. century men's fragrances, like they're going about it all wrong? I do. It's that smell. You know that smell. You know the smell that men's 
Well, in America, yeah. Because, I mean, if you go to, like, Iran, men smell like rose. Because yes. I think it's cultural, too. I'm talking about the big U.S., like— You're talking about the club boy scent here. In the- you know <laughs> is what it I'm ozonic, about, Jess? Jen? <laughs> it's powerful. Oh, it is. And I work with naturals, and they're not powerful in that way at all. Yeah, it's very, it has a synthetic quality to it. I know what you're talking about. It's like the frat boy kind of fragrance, yeah. the very like body spray kind of smell. My nose, my nose hairs feel frayed after. Well, you can't get away from them. <laughs> it's, yeah. very, it's very, it's very, they, they do, they do spread out. I also work with something called isolates. So I work with essential oils, but I also work with natural isolates, which I also think are misunderstood. I work with a lot of things that are modern in a particular way, but all natural. How are isolates misunderstood? People think they're synthetic because they're one molecule, but you can isolate one molecule. And I have a chapter of that in the book. You can isolate one molecule out from an essential oil. That molecule, I use vanillin, for example, that's not in vanilla, it's in clove. It's one strand of a vanilla molecule, which allows me to maybe bring vanilla to amber. It also shears it out. It changes the texture like of what I've made. Yes, you can do lots of very interesting things with an all-natural palette. So what's like a controversial ingredient that you use? Animals. The animal ingredients are extremely controversial. Some of them have no controversy and many of them do. How are you using these animals? First of all, I don't have any modern ones, but there are uh, animal ingredients that people, uh, they have a long tangled ethical history or ethical issues with, I think the most misunderstood one I'd say is ambergris. And where does this come from? Ambergris is the poop of the sperm whale and like one in a hundred sperm whales. And long ago, they did kill whales to get ambergris. But just very recently, a whale died and they did an autopsy and he died because he was full of ambergris. So the whale, it couldn't get it out. So they have to get it out of them to live. But if you're collecting the poop, and I'm a very big animal lover. It washes yes. ashore, yes. It washes ashore. If you are Collecting the ambergris, if, is it like I went into my cat's litter box and collected her poop and made a perfume out of it? And Do you know what I mean? That ambergris, they secrete something to make it. It's basically made from when they eat cuttlefish beaks or squid beaks. It irritates their stomach. And so they have to get that mass out of them. So from the places that I've consulted to that have ambergris, which are no longer around right now, but those particular places, beach harvest it. It's on the beach. And there are some extraordinarily funny and interesting stories of people finding it on the beach. It's like a lottery ticket. It's a lot. It's a complete lottery ticket. But why are people pissy or why would somebody be upset? Because he's already excreting it. It's not, if you can get it without killing the whale. I think that's what you're asking, right? Right. Like, like I understand why yeah, there's no reason to kill a whale for ambergris. That, that's my personal feeling. But if it's already out on the, the beach. Because they're confused. Cause, because people think they are killing the whale and they're not. I don't think that's going on at all anymore and hasn't gone on for a very long time. But you know, a story like that sticks to things. And trade restrictions were built around it. So you can't even like... Actually, I think because it's considered animal waste, which it actually is. Delicious smelling. It's, it is. And everybody smells it in the museum. And there are other considerations about those essences. But historically, they started out as medicine. Still not in love. Still not in love with the idea. Of people collecting ambergris? I, I don't know. It, it doesn't appeal to me. Like the idea of like animal poop. Yes. I, can, I completely understand that. It is a kind of miracle of transformation. Have you ever smelled the real thing? I don't think I've ever smelled the real thing. Because then it bakes in the sun and it gets the mineral water component to it of floating in the ocean. The synthetic version of it is called ambroxan, and that's in a lot of perfumes. Yes, yes, I have heard that, yeah. That is the synthetic version of it. But you asked me for controversy. 
Oh, yes. Yeah, there it going. is. <laughs> no, yeah, look at us. We're still talking about it. What about like a big find for you? Like, obviously, if you found some ambergris, you could sell it for $100,000. That's your lottery ticket. What's a Mandy find? Like something you were like, aha, I can bring this into my museum. And it was a, it was a beautiful find for you. For, first of all, I get offered ambergris pretty much every week and I never buy it. Why? Because it's too complicated. Oh, so you, I thought you were working with ambergris. I have, old- I have, I have old stuff. Okay. I have old of all of it, and I show it in the museum, but I don't actually get it. But now. you don't, you don't mess with it now because you don't want to get up. You don't want to, you don't want to mess with it. I feel like because you know when controversy starts, that's all there is, and I don't want to muddy any of this with you. I mean, you asked that. I question. think you're smart. And I'm just going to say one thing, and you're the expert, but I'm just going to say one thing. I have a feeling there are people who still harvest it by killing whales. Sorry. That's my, that's my thought. I, th- I think that's entirely, I think it's lucrative. Anything that's lucrative. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. See, uh, for me and my business model and the way that I work, I don't have any interest to grow. I don't want to grow my business. I've had enormous opportunity to be bought out and to grow. So when my business gets a little too big, I turn the business away because I like the activity of making everything myself. So I don't want to bring anything toward me that's really too big for me. I like being an artisan. I like it a lot. I like what I do every day from the minute I get up to the minute I go to bed. So all of that, which is a wonderful position, has no influence on me anyway. So even if I could make a bank, I wouldn't want to do it. That's a very powerful position. It's really powerful. (laughs) It also lets you focus on the things that interest you and not worry about what's making money. So thinking about like things that interest you, what's an acquisition that felt like this was my holy grail? I'm so glad to have brought this into the museum. Oh, I'd say pretty much almost everything I have in there. (laughs) Like I, I, I really, I kind of, she can't pick a favorite. <laughs> uh, I can pick. I can pick some. Like I got gardenia, you know, a gardenia absolute, real gardenia from Tahiti. That was amazing. One of my students went to Tahiti, and she met with this man who had gardenia, who was supplying LVMH, but they didn't want to spend the money anymore. But I did. So, mm-hmm. so he, he and he was really very ambivalent about selling. So it was like a complete treasure hunt to get his gardenia absolute. And I could tell just by the way he behaved, he didn't care whether he sold it or had it or wasn't going to go on with it. So I got, I got, eventually bought out every last droplet that he had. And the way I could tell was when you buy that and they ship it into the country, which I buy rare things all the time, you have to do all this paperwork to be able to make it, be able to make it into the country. And he never did any of it. He just mail it. And if it got there, it got there. And if it got lost, okay, didn't much matter. So it was, all of it makes me feel like I'm an old adventurer. How did it arrive? In like this unmarked box? It arrived in an unmarked box, which we went through so much to make sure it came. And I ordered from him more than once. It was always an adventure, but I like the adventure. Message me on WhatsApp at 7 p.m. and I will get back to you with the address. <laughs> so I, I kind of love that. I bought this incredibly beautiful, sustainable sandalwood made from roots of trees that had already been cut down. And that also, I mean, I was on the phone with the guy I bought it from at FedEx in India trying to get it onto the plane after it passed through CITES after it passed through whatever and stuff. Most of the oils I have are rare. They're not repeatable and they're really gorgeous. So a lot of my work goes into that. I have something called Meteatar, which is a co-distillation of sandalwood and dirt that smells like petrichor, which is the smell of rain on the earth. I like stuff that can't be repeated. I have another thing called Cypress Bio Absolute, where they have distilled the cypress. And cypress smells, when it's not in this form, like trees by the ocean. I have a forest bathing perfume that smells like that. But this is done from the waste. And then they do a solvent extraction of the waste. So it's twice cooked. So it's a very smoky cypress. And upcycled. We like that too. Upcycled. I have a lot of upcycled. And I have 100-year-old oils. 
So I collected a lot of oils from old bottles. So one of the exhibits in the museum is of bottles of 100-year-old essential oils that have never been opened because I like the labels and the little beaten tin on the lid and all those things. But I also have an exhibit of four modern essential oils compared to their counterparts from 100 years ago. So you could smell the aging process of, say, uh, cassia, which is a version of cinnamon. So it's got all these layers and you get to smell 100-year-old oils and you just feel it. You just get it. To some of the big brands, you mentioned the thing about like not wanting to, you have the power to not basically sell out, so to speak. But like, I'd imagine some of the things you're saying feel so aligned with a lot of the big brands that are out there and a lot of the just sort of trends. Like, have you been approached to do big projects with big brands? I was approached to be bought by LVMH. That was one thing that happened a long time ago. Or to be put in all the Sephora's. I've had a lot of opportunity. Or like private label, like something for... Some big brand? <laughs> or some celebrity? <laughs> yeah, like some celebrity stuff. I just feel like your sensibility and your capabilities in your library... Like Sarah Jessica like, Parker's like, no, I want Mandy to do my fragrance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wasn't thinking of her, but that's a good one too. I know, it was just mine. Yeah. yeah, I just feel like you're such an incredible resource. And you have this amazing organ... I usually turn people away. Yeah. I turn about nine tenths of what comes my way away because I like what I'm doing. And I'm not, and in my mind, when things that are big have a similarity of how they work or how the process goes or, and what's that or like? even being corporate. I, I used to, uh, this is a, just a very silly example. I used to do the... Um, scent for a hand sanitizer called Clean Well that was a- around a long time ago. It was natural. It was in Target. It was in Whole Foods. I remember this is a funny, sort of funny story. They had a marketing meeting. I was in the marketing meeting and they had to put me on mute because I kept saying so many things to them because I thought, you know, they were talking about what sells, like just that idea that they would know what sells and they had done some marketing with Chanel. This mar- and I thought, how can you possibly know? Half of the launches fail, which, of course, came out of my mouth. So I, I don't think I'm suited personally for, for, the corporate world. For, for, a big, for the corporate world. I just, I know I'm not. And <laughs> I'm thinking this is a scene in a movie. Put her on me. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> bah, 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 bah. <laughs> I, was, I was absolutely, I, I make a lot of. The people from Cleanwell went on and made Symbiome. Do you know Symbiome? They have skincare, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Those are the people I worked with in the past. Okay. You know, I, I just don't have any interest. I, I'm really doing what I like doing. I really am. So since you've been doing this for a while, though, you really have. And in the recent 10 years, people are trying to play more in the natural fragrance space. Like there are some are artisans like yourself. Some are just saying they're in the natural. What's your what's your take on the state of the natural fragrance? I get 96% natural. That is, that is the number we've landed on as an industry. We've decided, Mandy, and we're not budging. <laughs> just I you're got so it. right. Oh, my goodness. You know, one of the things I made a decision about a while ago, so I'm going to have to try my hardest to not be put, not We're do not something that gets me on mute. I don't get on the soapbox at all. Okay. I mean, this is a f- field that's been filled with lies forever. All the way back. What? It's been filled with <laughs> snake lies oil salesman. forever. Oh. It's <laughs> gone on forever. So all, all I, the way I think about it is lucky me that I slipped yeah. through and that I get to do what I like. And I have so many repeat customers. I, you know, I have those very, those antique boxes, you know, those for my solid perfumes. Have you ever seen those yes. on my site? Yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. People uh-huh. send them back. I refill them. I get to do what I believe in. And I feel so, and that something that lets me grow as an artist. So what all those other people are doing is not of much interest. I once was in, Henry Bendel's a long time ago, but I, and I did, my first exhibit was at Henry Bendel's, but they really chased after me, but I got to see what it's like when I'm not connecting to my customer. And also the world is open to that now. 
Like people, the customer themselves is really interested in connecting with the person who makes their stuff. It's a wonderful time to be an artisan. Before you had to be in a big store, you had to take out an ad. Now you can just do your work. So I'm grateful for that. Do you speak, are you speaking to digitally? You can connect with people. Absolutely. You okay. And we have far reach. I mean, we really, we really, really do. And it's amazing because I'm still working here. I just feel very lucky. I think it's a privilege in life to do something you believe in and can grow with and that puts beauty in your life, whatever that is. I'm completely in favor of it. Yeah. I don't think Jess and I had on our bingo card that the pandemic would make people more <sighs> interested in fragrance personally. But it does. Like, be- oh. Right. And so what I hear you saying, though, is explaining why that is. That digital, because we could connect digitally even when we couldn't be close personally, the fragrance somehow is transcending the wires. But I think also, like, just being able to talk directly to people. Like, I mean, like, Jen and I, like, we, we were, I was DMing with someone the other day. They're like, oh, hi, love the show from Norway. And I was like, oh, my God. Jen and I were working at magazines our whole lives and never knowing really who our readers were. And now it's like Jen and I are talking to Mandy without being mitigated by a paper product and our publishers. And now you're, the three of us are here together talking to somebody from Norway. Like, that connectivity is so amazing. And it goes into their hearts. I see that it goes into, it really deeply goes in. And I've heard so many stories about my own fragrances, how, I mean, we had this unbelievable experience. I mean, we've had many of them, but a guy came to the museum and got like samples from us. We have like a little tiny bit for sale in the museum, not much. And he took it to his mother who was on hospice and she smelled it. And he had not had a conversation with her in months. He took samples to her and she just, smelled the perfumes of mine and started talking to him and he got to connect with her before she died. And and that wow. that is an unusual story, but it is not all by itself. So I feel like the stuff that we do, more so than anything, it puts happiness in people's lives. It does. And I feel like because there are so many samples, people can just get a sample. You know, they don't even have to get the whole thing. And there's a kind of personal connection. That's beautiful, Mandy. I uh, Not to make it Jen's science corner, but there's so much neuroscience research now on how just smelling things can help reconnect neurons in the brain with different dimension things. So I'm not surprised at all by that story. It's beautiful, though. On a magical sense. There's also a magical quality to it. I don't want to make it all scientific, but... There is a magical quality to it. And I think people experience that, too, when they garden when they smell their coffee, when they smell their tea, all of the best beverages are aromatic. I feel it's also a conviviality aspect. I think people are very passionate. I see groups come to the museum and share stuff with one another. And we have these great experiences. Like I remember just about a week ago, this, we had two of these, two sets of this in one day. This woman came who was really into perfume. She dragged her husband who made it really clear to me he did not want to be there. We had two of them in one day. And then we had the exhibits where he could go outside and smell and looked at the stuff that's kind of beyond the commercial product that's there. And she said, I heard her say, it's time to leave. He says, I don't want to go. You can go and come back for me in 15 minutes. So I feel like once you open yourself up, which is what you're doing with your podcast, and you have passion for this yourselves, that people relate to this and that the big commercial businesses are the far end of that. But just regular people are really what that's about. It's really as simple as that. Mandy, what are you drawn to? What do you wear? Do you wear perfume? I just launched a perfume that I was working on for a long time. So I'm wearing that. I usually wear the last thing I've made because all of my perfumes are built around two essences in a conversation with each other and a problem, an aesthetic problem I want to solve. So the one you're wearing now, what's the, walk us through it. It's Hey Jude is the name of the perfume. And it's named after a rose in my yard called Jude the Obscure. And that that rose of all my hundred roses is the most gorgeous smelling rose by far. And so it's this creamy, cuppy kind of, Beige, but very rich, beigey, deep-leafed, deep 
petaled rose, and it's peachy and apricotty rose. And I just brought the flower in over and over and was trying to get it. And of course, I love the idea of calling it Hey Jude, because it was such a kind of of my generation title for it. So I felt I got there. So the problem, you gave yourself a challenge. I want to translate this from my garden to the bottle. To the bottle. And when I put it out and it's it's gotten some reviews so far, people caught it. They caught that feeling. Or I, I had another perfume I made that got was the subject of an incredibly interesting article somewhere big, but I don't remember oh. where. Uh, it's a perfume mine called Memento Mori. And I made that oh, yeah. about grief and loss. I, that was a big article. Huge. And it was... Yeah, we'll find it. We'll put it up. Salon. It was on Salon. Salon. Okay. And it was about someone I loved that I had lost. I was very, very unspecific about it, but it was about grief. It was a sad perfume. And it was about the smell of someone's body that you're close to that you won't be close to again. And people would write me when they would buy it and they would say, this perfume is sad or it's, I'm grieving. And I, before the article came out, so somehow that message in the bottle got to people. And I, I just loved that. I thought it was very special. You could get people to feel an emotion by something you sent them in a bottle. That's so cool. When you created Memento Mori. Yes. I I was at Memento Mori and they said this perfume is sad. Was your intention for them to wear it for comfort or for pleasure or just to smell and feel connected? Like, What was your intention for the wearer? I felt, first of all, I felt it smelled a bit like a a body. You know, it had that clean body smell, which was not so easy to do with naturals. I think that sometimes if you've had grief and who hasn't, and you've grieved something, someone, somewhere, that as you move through those stages and kind of let that wash over you, it takes you to a better place. It takes you along with it because it's a deep well of human experience. And I just hoped it touched someone that way and that the kind of the beauty of our deep emotions would be more accessible to them. But I didn't have the idea I'd be able to do it, but it was for me. What was very interesting about that perfume, and all the perfumes are kind of a journey, it completely mirrored the relationship. Like it was there, and then it was gone, and then I had it, and then it smelled terrible. I mean, when I went through the process of making it, my process of making it had plenty of Involved grief. It was kind of like my relationship. It was like, whoa, this is a wild ride. It's like kind of almost like what I went through with the person. And then I got to this sense of peace at the end of it. It was a really deep process for me. It must have been very healing too. It was incredibly healing. It was healing in the way I think art is healing or Mm -hmm. even craft for the maker, which is when you do something with your feelings, whatever they may be, and you face them, which my 30 years of being a shrink are not entirely gone from me, I feel like you transform it. You transform who you are and the experience by going through it. And I do believe that. So it was that for me. And when I got to the other end, I did feel better. And when I wear it, I feel better. Grief never totally goes, but you can transform some of it. Yeah. So, all right, we have... A few more things we want to ask you about. You have to um, come to a lighter portion yeah. of the podcast. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry. No, it's beautiful. We were both thinking, I think we were both thinking about that process. It's a very human thing. And, and I think you're probably the first perfumer to talk about grief through fragrance. And I think that is quite a feat. You know, they, they use that in, in a lot of death rituals that were very important, particularly in, say, ancient Egypt. And I think that fragrance was there to accompany people to the next world. And on a side note, when Leonard Cohen died, I happened to have fragranced both of his memorials, the Buddhist one and the Jewish one. I was at both of them. And with the Buddhist one, they made an altar of all my things to take him because they feel the soul goes in transit to the next world and they sent my stuff with him. That's quite an honor. Wow. Huge honor. 
We're going to keep it light and peppy. Okay. Ready? Sorry. <laughs> this is our fat, no, 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 sorry. This is our fat mascara. It wasn't a directive. Don't apologize. It, Absolutely it? Don't, don't say apologize. you're sorry. This is, this, is my, this is my transition to the Fat Mascara 5, which is my light and peppy <laughs> lightning round. <laughs> just, no, there's questions. no segue away, away from this. Ready? Go for it, Jess. What is the first fragrance you ever fell in love with? Joy. My mother wore Joy perfume. And she'd come and kiss me goodnight, and she'd have joy on her mink coat. This was the 50s. And there was some animal smell from the coat. It was furry yeah. and soft, and it smelled like flowers. Isn't it funny how, like, I, my, I, had, I grew up in the 80s, and like I said, light and peppy, lightning round. I'm like, now I'm like chatting. Like, but like <laughs> the, fur, the fur coats mixed with the, with the fragrance are like too much. Like, it's... And a little cigarette in there, maybe? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Hey, Jen, thank you. The cigarette. Okay, that was my aunt, right? Yeah, the, and my cousin. I love all that. So sexy. Right? Yeah. I'm so, like, not into fur, but it's like that that whole mix is, like, so comforting to me. Yes. Fur coat. I bring in some cold winter air as they walk in the door with it, and you're good to go. Yeah. I'm, not every, I'm with oh. you. I'm with you. I'm from Detroit. I'm with you. Uh, right? It's like, I love you, ladies. I love you, <laughs> ladies, right? These are yeah. fabulous women. Okay. Yes. What is the most valuable item in the museum? And it could be emotionally valuable or monetarily valuable. It's up to you. The organ with all the oils, because it is kind of the whole history of the world there. But that piece of oud is pretty spectacular, too. The very big piece of oud that looks like a dog it's a very big piece. It's in the museum. That's pretty valuable to me. Well, it looks a little like a dog's head, but it's just a piece of wood. But it's it smells amazing, and it just looks very sculptural. And it's an honor to have it. There's a picture of it in the book. Yes. Who was the most interesting guest who's ever stepped foot in the museum? So Julian Furmanich, the heir to Furmanich, came yeah, we've heard his, of him. Oh, oh you know, <laughs> For anyone oh, you know, who doesn't. Well, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. sorry. Okay. I didn't know if you'd know who No, no, no. I just meant like the name resonates with Jess and I, yes. Yeah, but can you explain who that, who that is? Yes, yeah. please do. Well, so there's four big companies, you know, five or six or whatever they are, that kind of run the world of fragrance. And one is Furmanich. There's a place here in Berkeley called Amorous that does kind of bio isolates and squalene and other things. And they were having a special visit from him. And so they booked the museum for a special visit and they brought him to the museum, Julian Furmanich, to meet me. And it was really special for me because he, he, I believe, was so surprised that I had the stuff that I had down to the oils and He's very big business and was talking and asking where I got certain things and whatever. And it was a very flattering. It was just a very special, flattering experience to connect with him and have him admire the museum. Is there a mass market fragrance that you like? I don't know any mass market fragrances. Well, there isn't like anything at like Macy's Joyce. That, that, yeah, <laughs> that like you would go in and be like, oh, you know, that's a goodie. I don't, I know nothing about mass market fragrance. I mean, people come to the museum and I send them to a website. I honestly live in my own world and don't know. I don't know the mass market. If I, I, I have, you know, people I know that have perfume lines that are little lines, but I don't know the mass market stuff. Oh, okay. All right. It's okay. This is her answer, guys. This is it. Okay. She's, mm-hmm. she's not into it. She's not, <laughs> she's not feeling it. <laughs> Okay. And then finally, it is 12 noon on a Saturday. What are you doing? I'm in the museum. Saturdays are, our museum is only open on Saturday. Okay. Sunday. So that's where I am on Saturday. I'm there every day, every Saturday. I'm out there with my visitors going out and talking, introducing myself and talking to them. But you don't mean that part of it. You must mean something else. So tell, like, what am I, what, what do I do with what my life? What are you doing on like your downtime? Yeah. What do I do in my downtime? Oh, I do a lot of things in my downtime. I'm working on another book, so I'm writing. I have a, a I have two more That's books. That's work, in, Mandy. In my head, well, not totally for me, really. Not not totally for me. You know, for me, 
I would be doing, which is something I feel about an artist's life, you'd be doing it whether it was work or not. And so most of my life, I go for walks with my husband. We cook together uh, every night. We take baths together. We have a sauna. We do lots of fun, this very, is very fun romantic. things. very romantic. It's very romantic. Foster. Ooh. And I weave. I do a lot of weaving. How big I, is your bathtub? It fits too, because when we went to buy it, we both got in it, and I thought they thought it in the store. They were going to have a heart attack because we had to see it would be good for two people. But I also do weave. I started out in textiles and I weave. And that I do for downtime that's not work. I make little tapestries. As one does. Mandy, you're a Renaissance woman, truly. (sighs) I could talk to you for hours. Well, this is great. Also, if you get stuck ever about anything with ingredients or whatever you're doing with your with your perfume stuff always can come to me. I'm happy to answer or help or whatever with whatever you're doing. Jen, we, we got to get over there. We got to get over We're there. We're going to come visit you trip. soon. In the meantime, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Mandy. I really loved it. I'm very grateful. We hope you enjoyed the show. It's your reviews and feedback that help us make the podcast even better. Head over to iTunes to rate and review us or email your thoughts to info at fatmascara.com. We also want to answer your beauty questions and hear what products you love. To share a Razor One product with you or to ask a beauty question, email us at info at Fat Mascara. If you send it as a voice memo file, we can even share your voice on the podcast. You can also do that by leaving us a voice message. Our phone number in the United States is 646-481-8182. Thanks so much for listening. As we get into fall and winter, I have a little Gen Science Corner PSA for you. You need to wear your sunscreen every day, no matter the weather or the temperature. And you know our sponsor, Taizo, makes some of our favorite sunscreens. They're 100% mineral sunscreens because it's right there in the name. Taizo stands for titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. Their mineral sunscreens are by far the best choice for your skin, your body, and the environment. We've been raving about Tizo's all mineral sunscreens for so long, but I have to point out, they also have an incredible skincare line that focuses on the reversal of photo damage. There are products like the Advanced Vitamin C and E Serum and a great starter kit called the Photoceutical Skin Revitalizing Regimen. If you want a skincare regimen that's all there for you, nothing to think about or figure out, it's five full-size products with everything you need from cleanser to sunscreen. Just do not sleep on that cleanser in that regimen, (laughs) actually. It's foaming, but it's pH bound, so it's like gentle and doesn't dry out your skin, which you know is what we're all about this time of year here at Fat Mascara. If you want to check out Taizo Skincare and their award-winning best-selling mineral sunscreen, that's the Taizo 3 Tinted SPF 40 you always hear us talking about, we've got a discount code for you. Go to taizoskin.com and use the code FATMASCARA15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order. That's T-I-Z-O skin.com and use the code FATMASCARA15 for 15% off your order. If you want to hear, where'd you get that? This holiday season, Uncommon Goods is your secret weapon. Uncommon Goods is here to make your holiday shopping stress-free by scouring the globe to get the most remarkable and unique gifts for everybody on your list. Whether you're shopping for Secret Santa or for your entire family, Uncommon Goods knows exactly what you want. I know Jen found something very intriguing. I always find something intriguing. I've been shopping at Uncommon Goods for years. You love Uncommon Goods. I love it. And the gifts I've given people are those things that are like, what? How did you even find this? I swear I've given things to my parents and they said that. One example, I can't remember if this was two years ago or last year, but it is still available on Uncommon Goods if you want to get this. I got my parents this toggle switch plate. (laughs) It's like you put it over a regular on-off light in somebody's house and it has this steampunk little gears to make it into a toggle switch instead. And it looks just like a little special artwork. And if you knew my parents in their house, it's very popular there. And anytime they have a guest in the guest bathroom, they're like, your light switch is so cool. Where'd you get that? Jess, guess where they got it? Uncommon Goods. Well, they got it from me, but I got it from Uncommon (laughs) Goods. You know what I love? When you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. You know, we feel very passionately about that. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash fat mascara. That's uncommongoods.com slash fat mascara for 15% off. Do not miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary.